of what is the, the real outcome to, it, to kind of expect realizing that obviously in individual patients, individual disease states may be different. So, you know, what do we, what do we know about the use of the drug and, and side effects? And I'll talk a little bit about managing uh, side effects as well, too, and that seems very loud <laughs> so, uh, as well. So let's, uh, having said that, let's get going here. So let me just uh, uh, remind you this uh, the, the new VNS cartoon uh, here. Um, but obviously placed on the, the left side, uh, we'll talk about the stimulation. You know, we actually, you know, we talk to families, I mean, tell them that, you know, this is, you know, is a seizure is, you know, the simplified, you know, kind of version is that it's an electrical storm in the brain, that, you know, VNS sends an electrical pulse to the, the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve just is kind of the highway, if you will, that relays that to the brain uh, centers to, to hopefully interrupt, interrupt the electrical storm of the seizure or prevent it. Um, and I think pan families, it kind of helps them understand that. Otherwise, I think it's hard for them to understand uh, electrical stimulation and neuromodulation as well. Um, the one thing, though, that I will mention here, because we'll talk a little bit about the magnet later, is keep in mind that when we use a device, I mean, for the most part, we're really trying to modulate the kind of hyper-excitable brain, uh, make, make it less excitable so they have fewer seizures, and we're trying to kind of modulate that over time. Whereas when you use the magnet, it's, it's really there's a seizure there and you're trying to stop it acutely. So it's a very different uh, approach. It's almost like two different uh, uh, concepts behind the stimulation, if you will. One is more neuromodulation of the kind of the, the abnormal brain substrate. The other one is kind of interrupting acute uh, seizures. So it's, it's a different uh, concept between the two. Uh, you've heard about the approval uh, in 94 and, and EU. Uh, there's a lot of neurostimulation devices that are becoming uh, on the market that are different approvals now in the EU and the US. Uh, so I think you're going to hear more and more about neurostimulation uh, as time goes forward. There are now, think about this, one, two, three. In, in the EU, there are four uh, different neurostimulation devices that have CE mark approval. Uh, there will, by this year's end, should be in the, in the US two, and maybe by next year three, we'll see. So there's lots of neurostimulation devices. And the reason that these are coming out is probably the same reason that you don't have the same cell phone that you had two or three years ago, I'll bet. Because the technology keeps improving and advancing and our understanding of how to, how to do these things keeps advancing, uh, just like Greg was showing you with the improvements of vagus nerve stimulation uh, for patients uh, that, that need other options for treatment of the seizures. So I think uh, you know, neurostimulation is going to be around. And what I tell a lot of our folks in training is I think there will be, you know, down the road, three, five years, there will be enough different devices that at an epilepsy center, you'll probably have to have someone who's the neurostimulation specialist because it's going to be enough different devices. It's, it's going to be complicated for all of us to keep up with all of them, I think. There's going to be almost someone who's that's kind of their special niche uh, is to do the devices. So let me just uh, remind you, and uh, this is probably mainly important for the surgeon, I guess, right? Because you have to put the electrode on right side up and not the other way around uh, as well. But because uh, some patients think that, the, you know, that with the the device is actually kind of shocking the nerve, if you will, or, you know, you know, as well. So I'll kind of point out to them, no, it's just it's stimulating the nerve to create a normal kind of impulse up to the brain. We're just creating extra impulses, if you will. So the, the brain would be at the top of the slide. Uh, we have our, our anode and our cathode. And just like when you do peripheral stimulation, you have uh, your cathode, your positive electrode, uh, you know, the, the uh, distant end of the nerve. Uh, with the idea being that that'll block impulses going this way, so they don't go this way. And let me see if I do this right with the animation. There we go. <laughs> uh, so you get your uh, cathode blocked, just like you would with peripheral nerve stimulation, and the impulses are all uh, going the way we want, uh, up to the brain, uh, to the, the, the brainstem centers to cause the kind of the mechanism of action of this product. So one thing I'll mention here, and we'll come back to this, but if you think about it, again, just like stimulating your peripheral nerve, in the vagus nerve, there's, there's only so many nerve fibers. And so, just like when you stimulate a peripheral nerve, once you stimulate all the fibers, you can stimulate at higher intensity, but doesn't do any good because you've already captured all the fibers. And the same is true of vagus nerve, and we're kind of using that to figure out now kind of dosing and how do we do that. So I'll, I'll come to that in a little bit, but that's actually, that understanding I think helps us to get to that uh, as well. Um, well. We'll come back, but the uh, to the, the, the minimum dosing here in a little bit, but the mechanism is through that, you know, the vagus nerve is made up of A, B, and C fibers, and it's through the A and the B myelinated fibers, and especially the smaller 
uh, fibers in that group. So it's the small myelinated fibers that account for most of kind of the mechanism of getting the impulse uh, up to the brain. Uh, once we get there in the brain stem and through the locus ruleus, there's a lot of changes that have been documented. Um, and occasionally patients will ask me, not too often, uh, but how the device works. And I always tell them it's just like a lot of our medicines. I mean, a lot of our medicines, we may know one mechanism of how they work, some we know a couple, but we really don't know all of them for almost any of our medicines. There are rare exceptions, like bicapitran, I guess, and a couple other medicines. But most of our medicines, we just have an idea or two of how they work. We don't know completely. And I tell them, you know, the device is very similar. We have some ideas uh, from animal and human work of what uh, changes that occur and that might uh, explain the mechanism. Is that the only way? Probably not. There's probably other ones we don't understand, so it's very similar. Uh, but some of these are actually helpful when thinking about kind of other benefits of the device. So the, fa the fact that at the brainstem level we see changes in neurotransmitters and especially we see elevations in serotonin and norepinephrine. So if I just told you that I was elevating those in the brain, it wouldn't really surprise you that the patients felt better, right? that they, their mood was better, because I'm changing brain uh, serotonin levels, so it shouldn't be a surprise that the drug, you know, the device works for depression because we're altering those in the brain. So uh, when it became clear that the device had effect on mood, it, it really wasn't such a big surprise, because these were known from animal uh, studies that you could affect those neurotransmitters, so it really kind of makes sense. Uh, but the other changes are different. The, the changes that we see in blood flow uh, in deep gray centers, you know, it's not usually, you know, something that we see with other targeted therapies for epilepsy. Most of our medicines we think work cortically, right? We don't think they work at brain stem or deep gray matter. I mean, maybe the exception is ethosuximide for absence seizures, but for, you know, most other, you know, medicines we think of as being, you know, cortically based. So it's a different, you know, mechanism, if you will, uh, from, from medicines as, as well. So at the end of the day, do we know everything? No, but we know some. <laughs> All right, so the, just to remind you that the device was studied, the pivotal trials, uh, EO5 was the first one that um, I was involved with, as I said, in 1995 uh, down, down here. Uh, but a lot of uh, kind of some were control studies, the other were kind of the you know, initial open label uh, studies to look at uh, outcome uh, in large numbers of patients. Uh, and the other devices that are being looked at now, uh, at least that are approved or uh, the major devices are similar number of patients, so it it's, tends to be pretty robust uh, numbers to get to an approval status. Oops, what did I do? <laughs> okay, let's see if I can get that out there. Okay, maybe we'll go over here and get it out there. Okay. Um, the, the patients, though, that were in the trials were really the worst of the worst. And I can tell you the ones we had were, I mean, they really had no other choice. I mean, these patients were really bad off. They were adults, like always. They started with their epilepsy in childhood. So even though we, I know we have mainly pediatric neurologists here, we have some adult. Is We have to remember we do pediatrics that our patients grow up. And when they grow up, they might move out of our practice, but they go to the adult practice where they're stuck with them for a long time <laughs> with their refractory epilepsy. We may only have them for 18 or 20 years. They may have them for 40 or 50 years. So we have to try and help our adult colleagues out, right? <laughs> so that it doesn't become their problem. Um, but this is a long time, 20 plus years of epilepsy, you know, averaging, uh, you know, over one seizure a day. So they have 45, 50 seizures a month. So these are really, really bad patients. You know, on two medicines, they've failed multiple medicines. They really are, I mean, they had patients that, you know, had no other options, if you will. They, uh, oops. Hmm. Okay, I'm not sure when I keep getting that. Am I pushing the wrong button here? Yeah. Use that one. Oh, down here. Okay, I was using the right one before and I forgot. Okay. <laughs> All right, did I skip one? Let's see. No, okay. All right, so um, the studies were obviously positive that led to the approval. Uh, interestingly enough, all of the devices show this improvement over time. So vagus nerve stimulation showed this in and, and the trials, and people kind of scratched their head and said, well, that's weird. Why does, you know, do you see this kind of improvement over time? Uh, even if you don't change medicine, you don't do anything else, you get this, you know, slow improvement. Um, responsive neurostimulation has shown that. Deep brain stimulation has now shown it with no medicine changes. So there's something kind of different about neurostimulation where you see these late changes. Again, do we fully understand this? No. What we think happens 
is that because of this neuromodulation effect, uh, that you change long-term potentiation in the brain, so you actually you know, kind of raise the seizure threshold, if you will, make it harder for the person to have a seizure. So again, very different than the kind of acute seizure you know, model uh, in, in animals uh, and in, in humans, obviously. So we, we see this kind of uh, in multiple forms of stimulation. If we switch from the, you know, the trials, if you will, to the real-world experience, uh, the trials are critical, obviously, for approval, but just like the medicines, we look at, you know, medicines that are approved, they're using the worst of the worst patients, too, and then when we get them, you know, after approval, uh, we usually all do better because we're not trying them in the worst of the worst patients. We're trying them in refractory patients, but they're not quite as bad as usually the ones that are in the trials. So we usually do better, and the same is true of the device. So as you, this is just several large, kind of, if you will, post-approval trials, and what we see is that it tends to be, I always tell folks, about 50%, 50% responder rate. So what does that mean? It means that about one in two patients that you put the device in, you look overall, so not specific patient types, but big numbers, should have their seizures cut in half or more. Uh, this is very kind of similar criteria we use for medicines, if you will. It's not obviously the same criteria we use for traditional surgery. So we switched uh, from that kind of criteria more to uh, medicines, if you will, uh, criteria. I think that's important to understand. Uh, and I think our patients understand this, because when we talk to you about new medicines, if they've already been on four or five medicines, and I say, geez, I'm gonna, I'm gonna you know, try a new medicine, they say, ah, what am I, you know, is this likely to help me? Um, yes, it could help them. It might reduce their number of side effects, uh, but we usually talk about kind of responder rates or 50% improvement in those patients. So it's a very similar uh, concept uh, to what we do with those patients. There's a couple of recent large papers that I want to kind of spend a little more time with you on, just kind of that's by way of background, but just to kind of show you the kind of more recent uh, confirmation, kind of uh, confirming some of this data and, and uh, you know, what do we, uh, you know, know with, with more use, and as we said, we've got, you know, 17, 18, you know, soon it's going to be uh, 20 years of, of use of the, of the device here. All right, so this is one, this is uh, from a couple papers that are out of the group at the New York University. It was a very large series, a single surgeon, comprehensive epilepsy centers, the patients are being evaluated, if they can't have surgery, this is an option that's offered uh, to those patients. So long uh, series of patients with kind of a consistent uh, team, if you will, uh, evaluating and doing the follow-up uh, with these patients looking at them. So again, it's interesting, this holds up uh, in all the studies. If you look at the onset, the average age is childhood. It's always, you know, childhood. Uh, and then look at your follow-up prior to VMS, almost 20 years, which is amazing. So even though this device has been in the market for 18 years, the original studies was 20.9 years, now it's 19.2 years, almost no different, right? So even though you think we would be better about identifying refractory patients, we heard earlier that we all kind of said, gosh, you know, once they've been on two, three, four medicines, we can tell it still is taking 20 years <laughs> for people to get here. Uh, and it's not much better for epilepsy surgery. If you look at epilepsy surgery in the U.S. at least, it still is about 15 years on the average. It hasn't, you know, even though we all said in a couple medicines you tell, uh, they don't get there in three or four years for epilepsy surgery. Most patients either. They still have a long uh, kind of wait uh, before people feel comfortable that they're really, really refractory uh, as, as well. Uh, so as you can see, what's interesting from their center as well, look at the children and adults. So below 18, if we look at all comers, it was about 29%, almost 30. So it's interesting, if you look at the U.S. and world sales, I guess not U.S., of VMS, about 30% are age 17 and below. So there's over 20,000, is that right? I think 30% is 70,000, yeah. Over 20,000 children that have had DNS, which means you know, 50,000 adults uh, that have had it. So it's a huge number of, of children. It's not a small number anymore of, of children. And you see the breakdown by kind of, in the US they broke down by age 12 or above. And the only reason they picked age 12 is because that's the official approval in the U.S., although we could ignore it uh, without any work. <laughs> it's the official. So that's why they kind of pulled that out in case you're wondering as, as well. Uh, and you see here, I mean, they've been on a lot of medicines. So most had been on almost six medicines prior to getting here. About a third had had prior surgery as well. So they thought they were surgery candidates. They were trying to help them because they had horrible epilepsy they operated on. The thing I would point out is prior failure does not mean they weren't helped at all. Many of our epilepsy surgery patients, even if they're not surgery seizure-free, they're better, they're just not seizure-free. 
So it doesn't mean they were, you know, no different. It often means their seizures were approved, they just still were refractory, unfortunately, uh, as well. And this is the challenge we have. I know somebody has mentioned earlier that see a lot of patients with cognitive disability. Well, cognitive problems are common in this refractory group. I mean, and look, if you look at the DMS registry, it's a huge number, too. It tends to probably be almost half the patients that have cognitive or mental impairments. Just kind of, if you have refractory epilepsy it, for many, many years, it just almost goes hand in hand uh, that you're going to have that. It doesn't have to, but it's, it's uh, well represented there as well. So if you look at how they did, and they broke this out, but this is probably the key, the group that had a greater than 50% reduction, uh, theirs was a little more robust. This is one of the higher numbers, up to 64, above that kind of 50% mark we were talking about. Now, there are some patients who do quite well. Uh, we don't promise our patients seizure freedom with this therapy. Uh, we tell them the goal is to kind of minimize their seizures, improve their quality of life, but there are patients that do dramatically, you know, better with it. Um, it's hard to identify predictors for that. There's a more recent meta-analysis to this paper and that tried to look at kind of many of the VMS papers and met outcome criteria. Uh, it was over 3,000 patients in their meta-analysis and look at predictors of kind of positive outcome. Uh, and we talked about those on the adult side uh, and actually adult and pediatrics. If you had a normal MRI, that was a positive <coughs> predictor. Uh, mainly on the adult side, if you had a prior history of head trauma, that was actually a positive predictor of good outcome. Uh, children overall did a little better than adults as far as response. And children with tuberous sclerosis who were not felt to be surgery candidates actually did better overall than the kids that didn't have. So they're starting to emerge some kind of positive predictors. Doesn't mean the other folks won't respond. These are just groups that seem to do even better uh, that we're starting to be able to tease out as, as well. Uh, in their group, uh, you see that the patients were basically partial seizures. Uh, you know, focal EEG, partial seizures tend to do better. Again, these are patients that cannot have epilepsy surgery for whatever reason uh, as well. And they have a very vigorous epilepsy surgery program. So uh, if they thought they couldn't have epilepsy surgery, I would, I would believe them because they run about uh, 38 monitoring beds at a very busy <laughs> epilepsy program, very good surgeons. So, you know, they do over 150 surgeries a year. So, I mean, they, they, they know how to do epilepsy surgery. So if they thought they couldn't, I would say, okay, probably these were partial seizure patients that couldn't have uh, had it. Uh, in their center, they, they did not show children doing better. But again, if you look at, like I said, the meta-analysis, the children do a little bit better uh, than adults uh, as well. Uh, and they did have patients who had prior uh, intracranial monitoring, epilepsy surgery, um, that went on to, to VMS that either couldn't have surgery or had surgery and still had some seizures uh, afterward. Um, if you look at their complication rate, um, and, and my bias is uh, that mm, this is probably in the ballpark, I guess, uh, as well. Uh, it's, and some of these are actually more predictable. So, for example, significant trouble with hoarseness. I think this is almost all adults in our experience. We almost never run into it in the pediatric problems. The adults are just more susceptible to the voice change. And when we talk about dosing later, we'll talk about some strategies to minimize it, but I think it's much more common in the adults than, than the kids uh, that we see just developmental differences in, the, in, the, in, the, in the, uh, the nerve and the brain stem that account for that. Uh, and you see the other ones, but basically this is pretty pretty minor uh, list. And I have to admit, you know, we talked a little about drop attacks uh, earlier. Uh, we had looked at our center recently at kids that uh, had treatment for drop attacks uh, with either VNS or callosotomy. We looked at the last 100 callosotomies, consecutive callosotomies, in the last 200 consecutive VNS, and their complication rate was no different. They were both very low. So if you have a good surgeon, you can do callosotomy with a very low complication rate. But I think the key is your surgical expertise for that procedure. I hope you agree with me. <laughs> you don't want just any surgeon doing probably a callosotomy. Any neurosurgeon, they have to know, know that procedure and where the vessels and the anatomy is so, uh, as, as well. Um, so obviously this is a, a large you know, center, it's not a controlled trial, there are limitations, but I think in a large center it kind of, you know, it does give you a feel that, you know, with experienced folks doing it, you know, what's, you know, expected for, you know, kind of outcome, um, you know, and, and are there, you know, predictors, and actually probably the complication, the surgical one is, is the one that's pretty valid, because, you know, whether you're a controlled study or not, those are, those are what they are, so, and, and it's pretty minimal, those are, those tend to be about the same either way. If you switch gears and look at now, this is the pediatric kind of subset of their, of their study, uh, if you will, the 141 that were uh, pediatric patients. 
So obviously the key difference is we don't have the, the, the you know the 20 years of epilepsy uh, uh, length, but it's interesting enough it's 8.4 years. So that the largest series prior to this surgery uh, series in kids is one that actually I was involved with. It's 125 children uh, that was done uh, in the early uh, 2000s, and our average duration at that time was 9.1 years. So again, it's almost not changed at all, even though the device has been out 19 years, because you know you can only have so long a duration in childhood, because otherwise you're not childhood anymore. So it's, it's never going to be 20 years, right? Because then by definition you have adult patients. Uh, so it's, it's interesting. Even the children, who I think we all agree you can tell pretty shortly too, uh, it still takes us a while to, to get to this, uh, this point uh, as, as well. Uh, and again, same number of medicines failed. The adults were almost six. This is you know five and a half, six medicines. So it's interesting, I think we all talk about kind of two to three medicines, uh, but most of the patients don't end up getting something done until they've almost had twice as many medicines tried. Uh, and I think what we tend to do, uh, at least in our center, is knowing that you know, by two or three we should be able to tell the refractory, is that's the point that we start talking to the patients and saying, you know, gosh, you know, you're, you know, this isn't working, you're refractory, you know, we've got to start thinking about what other options are available and evaluating it you know, for you. So we at least start kind of, uh, you know, getting, getting them thinking that other than medicines, you know, whether it's surgery, BMS, the diet, that there may be other options I need to be, you know, thinking about and, and they're thinking about it uh, rather than kind of, you know, waiting and saying, oh, we need to do this now. So they've had a chance to kind of get used to the idea, if you will. Uh, and while we're doing that, we may try another medicine or two, and I think that's what kind of drives a lot of this. Uh, and you see in their series, the developmental delay was very high, almost 80% of the children. So a huge number of children with developmental delay uh, getting the device. Um, again, their numbers you see, the children, you know, teeny bit higher in their center. I think the meta-analysis was a little bit more, but uh, you, see, you see what their outcome was across the board in, in, in children. Um, the pediatric side effects are pretty, pretty minimal, no real difference from, you know, adolescents and adults uh, as, as well. Uh, the only probably big difference is, you know, as we saw, a lot more of the kids had developmental delays, so if they had a, you know, minor, you know, change, would you notice it? I mean, you may not because some of those kids, you know, maybe were, you know either were not talking or, you know, not very verbal, but uh, so you can always argue with the young kids, you know, are the side effects underreported just because the kids can't tell you. But, but not major problems, uh, comparatively any different than the adults. And again, you see the listing here. Most of these are pretty, pretty rare. Uh, and again, same same uh, caveats, because there you know, was uh, kind of them looking at their, uh, you know, population. It wasn't controlled, so okay, these are the same as they were on the, the adults. And again, all of them had a pre-surgical evaluation, or just felt not to be candidates in a you know multidisciplinary you know, setting they were reviewed. All right, let's switch gears because this came up earlier to the kind of the magnet use uh, and what this does. So I, I think the key, like I said, you really have to keep in mind is, you know, when we use a device to treat kind of the spontaneous seizures, we're doing, you know, we're hoping to neuromodulate having one effect. We're using the device to treat a, a seizure that's either, you know, starting or ongoing or clustering that we're trying to interrupt. It's a very different concept. There we're trying to actively, you know, kind of abort the seizure. So even the animal models would be kind of different. One is kind of like a chronic seizure model, the other is like an acute, you know, how do I stop the seizure model. So I think we have to keep that uh, in, in mind. Uh, you know, and how well, you know, the magnet works or doesn't work. Um, usually with the patients, it's very easy. Because uh, the patients, it works, you can tell. They always, when they come to clinic, right, they have it on their wrist, their belt, the mom has it, you know, you know handy or close by. Uh, and the ones that doesn't work, it's stuck to the refrigerator at home holding a picture up or something, <laughs> right? So it's very easy to tell, from the, the, the patients tell you if it works or not, right? Uh, kind of as, as well. Uh, and when you talk to families, I mean, they'll tell you different things. It, it usually doesn't work 100% of the time with anybody, right? So even in the folks that say it works, I mean, they'll say that, you know, some of the times it either shortens the seizure duration, uh, the seizure cluster maybe is, is not as bad if they tend to cluster with the seizures, uh, or the recovery times uh, quicker. Uh, with those things. Uh, there are rare patients that have been captured in epilepsy monitoring units. We've had patients like this, we've been re-monitoring. They have a seizure, we swipe the magnet, you can actually see how quickly, you know, does it respond quickly, because it should be quick, right? Because all the magnet's doing is just flipping a, a magnet uh, switch in the device. 
that you're basically like turning on or off the light switch, right? And then it's sending electrical stimulation to the nerve, and then that's carrying action potentials to the brain. So all that should happen in you know a fraction of a second, right? I mean, it takes almost no time. So if it's going to work, you should know, you know, within a second or two, it shouldn't take you know uh, very long uh, for that to abort the seizure if, it, if it's going to. Um, so we tell the patients, you know, when we first put it in, you know, that the magnet is there. You don't have to use it. If you never use the magnet, if the device is going to work, it should help you. Because a lot of patients, I think, feel guilty, like, oh, I have to be able to use the magnet or it won't work. So we tell them that up front, that, you know, you don't have to use the magnet. It's kind of uh, extra. It's a uh, saying I use it's icing on the cake. <laughs> you know, it kind of gives you something extra to, to do. Um, the other thing we tell them, though, that's an important thing to keep in mind was the magnet is uh, that you may not realize is every device that's sold requires an off switch. So the patient can always turn the device off, and the magnet is their off switch. Uh, for deep brain stimulation, they have a little off switch. It's basically a little programmable thing that they can turn and hit off if they're having problems. The responsive neural stimulation will have an off, you know, kind of switch the patients get hit. They all of the requirement they have to have it. So the magnet, this one just has a, you know, it's inexpensive off switch, just a heavy duty magnet. And if you hold it over the device and you leave it there, it will turn the device off. So I always tell patients that's probably you know an important use not to forget about the magnet if they ever think they're having problems, especially if it's at night or on weekends. <laughs> just put that over there. You know, you can turn the device off. They don't have to worry about you know getting hold of somebody in the middle of the night to check it. Uh, and then when you take the magnet away, the device will start back on. So it'll come back on, but they can always turn it off as well. I think that's a very important one to keep in mind. Um, the only the data we really have on the magnet side from what patients tell us in clinic is from the controlled studies where patients had to record if they used the magnet and whether it helped or not. So it's not video EEG monitoring, it's you know, the patient's voting. Uh, so what did the patients tell us? You know, about a third, a little over a third of the time, no effect. Not quite two thirds of the time, it helped some. Some the seizures were, you know, milder, some they thought the seizures stopped. So and like I said, I think it does have an effect. Are there good predictors of who will be helped with the magnet? Um, my own experience, I think the best predictor is probably adolescents and adults that have partial seizures, and if they have a uh, a, a very uh, stereotyped aura. So before every seizure, you know, they say I get a consistent, you know, feeling in my stomach, some kind of aura. That the folks with the aura. Uh, probably respond better to the magnet. A lot of that may just be that they have more time because their seizure is developing slower, so they feel it, they have a time to swipe and kind of turn it off before, you know, it's kind of full blown, whereas some of the, you know, other seizure types, you know, they're so they're kind of the horses out of the barn, if you will, <laughs> before they swipe, so it's, it's hard to do. It'll be interesting to see once the automated kind of magnet, the, you know, the closed loop system is in place, um, you know, does that change some of that? We'll know over the next probably be two years or so, but we'll know down the road, uh, you know, how much that that helps with this as well. Um, obviously, there's a lot of changes in quality of life. Probably the easiest one that we talked about is the mood because uh, of the changes. What's interesting is, you know, every investigator that I know of that's looked at these, they're yes, if the seizures get better, we would expect you know people to be better, to, their quality of life to be better. But even the folks whose seizures did not improve that much at all still reported improvements to their quality of life. So this is not totally dependent on improvement in seizures. And for most of our medicines, we don't see quality of life improvements unless the seizures are also better. So it's, it's different, if you will, uh, from that, we, that we see these. Um, and I always tell people, uh, this one down here, uh, where memory got better, uh, that's actually been looked at in a, in a lot of neuropsychologic studies with a positive memory effect. Um, I know many of you in the room are worried as you age about your memory, but I don't think it's quite good enough yet that I would get one put in yet, but it is there. <laughs> uh, it is there, and the company actually looked for a little bit of kind of, should they even think about Alzheimer's or not? I think they've decided to sit on that, because as you know from even medicines, that's just a nightmare to get into that <laughs> area. <laughs> so they're looking at other stuff, but there does seem to be these other you know, changes as well. Uh, this is the one that's become more recent, and in, you know, how, how this impacts you, is, it's different from every country I know, uh, but I can, I can tell you kind of, uh, you know, where this is probably going in the U.S., and it's different in every country because, as I, as I always hear, how different countries pay for things is very different from country to country, and you're hearing this morning, it sounds like, as, as well. 
But it is interesting because I think this, this helps me with patient selection probably more than anything else. So if we have a patient with refractory epilepsy that keeps coming back to the emergency department for either seizure clusters or prolonged seizures, but they just, you know, one of these patients that, you know, two or three times a year, they're always back at the emergency department the hospital to stay. Every uh, study that's looked at that in different countries has shown that after they get the Vegas nerve stimulator, their emergency department visits go down dramatically. Uh, and the most dramatic uh, paper is not uh, this one, but it's one that the uh, Simon Harvey, his group, did out of Australia. And they had almost 70 folks that they followed before and after. And in the two years after DNS, they had zero emergency department visits. So it was almost too good to believe, because it went down 100%, which is you know, almost hard to believe <laughs> that it could be that good. Uh, but everybody that's looked at it shows this decline. Uh, and if you get rid of the emergency department, then your expenses obviously go way down, because that's the most expensive part of, of care uh, for a lot of these patients. Uh, hospital stay, obviously, other, other things that went uh, with it. Uh, this is a more recent large study from the U.S. Um, in our country, the government's become more and more interested in cost because uh, they're assuming more and more of the cost. <laughs> they didn't used to you know, pay for most of it, so they weren't as uh, interested. Now they're paying more and more, so they've become more interested in, in the cost. Um, and so you can look, because with our country, the other thing that's changed in the last couple of years is we've gone to all electronic records. So anytime, like if I go to my doctor and sign in, it's all electronic. So somebody can look in the computer and they can see how many times I went to the doctor last year. If I go get a prescription at the pharmacy, that's electronic. So they can see, okay, how much medicines did I get? How much did that cost? I went to the hospital. If I went to get MRI, I mean, all that's electronic. So you can look and say, okay, what are all the expenses, uh, you know, that this person's generating uh, to the system. So what uh, Sandy did is use kind of some of the Government Information Act that we have in our country and said, well, geez, if everything's electronic, let's look at, at folks um, and see if it makes any difference. So you can see it's a huge number, uh, over 1,500 patients. This was mainly adults, but as you'll see, children and adults. And they said, let's look, they're being paid for by the government so we can track them, and they're getting you know, their, their best care Let's see how many hospital stays, emergency department visits, you know, their medicines, everything, their costs, and then they'll get DNS. They'll have a big cost then from the DNS and the surgeon mainly. We always say it's the surgeon mainly, but we know it's not. <laughs> uh, and then let's look at the cost afterwards and see how they do. And see, does it make any difference, or is it just, you know, yes, it's the, you know, we're paying this one-time big expense, but it doesn't, you know, change any of the other stuff uh, around. So you see, it looked at six months before, and then it was about two and a half years of follow-up to compare uh, afterwards, too. Um, and you see, like I said, large number of, of children. And a lot of these folks, again, cognitive impairment in almost half. About almost a third had depression, mood disorders, uh, sorry, third here, uh, and other problems. So it's a typical patient you'd expect to see with refractory epilepsy, you know, all sorts of other problems. Um, so what they saw was, if you look, hospital rates were down. For, you know, hospital days, seizure-related days, emergency department visits were down, as we talked about, and then a lot of the traumas, so bouts of status at the hospital, head traumas from falling with seizures, and the adults' fractures from falling with seizures, you know, not the kids so much, mainly the adults that we see as well. So a lot of these were uh, reduced, and what that meant was, if you look at the cost, and you don't have to look at U.S. dollars here, because I think it's the trend that's important, not the actual kind of money, if you will, is there's a, a big spike and when you start, because you have to pay for the device, right? So you have a huge expense, but you pay for it. So by the time you got out to the sixth quarter here, so a year and a half, because of the hospital stays, the emergency departments, all those things going down, you were actually saving money. And with a battery life of now seven, eight, nine years, depending on the settings of the new models, you pay for the device in a year and a half, and then after that, you start basically saving money to the system. So in our country nowadays, if I had a new device that I want to introduce to the market for any condition, not just epilepsy, I have to do a pharmacoeconomic analysis. Because if I say this works just as good as this other device or just as good as other medicine, the government says, okay, well, you work just as good, that's nice, and you're safe, but do you, do you cost us any more or any less than the other one? Because if it costs more, they may not approve it. But if it saves them money, they may say, aha, <laughs> we're interested in this. Which, you know, if you think about it, if you were the one paying for everything, I guess it kind of makes sense, right? I mean, it's kind of like what you do with your kids when you're paying for everything, right? <laughs> you kind of look at the cost and the benefits. So, I mean, it kind of makes sense, but this is just, you know, starting to change in our country a little bit. Uh, you know.
you know, as, as, as well. So, uh, but I know that this is very different because a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of countries and even a lot of hospitals have year-to-year -year budgets. So, unfortunately, it ends up being kind of short-sighted because you look at the year-to-year -year and not, you know, you're going to continue to follow the patients for, you know, many years. And if they're adults, they for their whole life or your whole life. <laughs> you know, so looking at a year that's not, you know, the best probably way to do it. Uh, so I think this is this challenges we all have. But I think this kind of data keeps emerging uh, from multiple countries. So it's just it's just interesting to kind of see where this will uh, change our decisions. Okay, what about any things that are unique to VNS or to having a device we have to know about? So probably the, the couple biggest ones, one that's not on here, the one that question that I get asked the most, I don't know if it's the one you get asked, is airport security. <laughs> that's the number one question I get from patients. Can I go to the airport? You can. <laughs> You go through, it doesn't change the device. They'll probably pick it up because it's metal, but it doesn't alter it, doesn't harm it, you know, doesn't do anything. That probably comes up more than anything else. Uh, most of my patients do not get, uh, oops, do not get, uh, you know, diathermy. You know, microwaves are not a problem. Cell phones are not a problem. Uh, if they got, uh, you know, because diathermy is mainly what kind of like athletes get. So if they have, a, you know, a thigh bruise or something and they're getting deep ultrasound or something, well, most of our patients are not, you know, getting that, and especially not right over the chest where the device is. That'd be, you know, kind of weird. So it's worth remembering, but I can, I've never had it come up literally ever. Uh, the one that somebody actually asked about that I, had, that I have actually have come up more often is, you know, kids that are active, I guess. So I actually have kids that will play um, hockey, field hockey, uh, football soccer uh, and so we just have them wear uh, much like the uh, professional quarterbacks for football in the u.s they can wear these vests uh, and they kind of inflate with air and they wear it under their shirt so if they get a blow it basically protects the wire and device and they're very inexpensive they can you know get them from like athletic stores so i mean we do that for those kids to minimize the, you know trauma um, but but these are usually not a problem the other one which is not listed here but it usually is not a problem either is they shouldn't be working uh, immediately next to a high voltage transformer. Well, most of our patients are not working on high voltage transformers that have intractable epilepsy because they, you know, we'd be worried they'd fall into the transformer or something. So again, it's not a practical problem, but theoretical one. Uh, and then the MRI labeling you, you heard about is just uh, kind of been changed uh, as well. So now uh, we do uh, these folks on both, well, we don't have 1.5 Tesla machines anymore. All of our machines are three Tesla. Uh, on three Tesla machines, but we do use the head transmit and receive coil. Once in a while it'll come up, and I had a patient, actually the dad's a radiologist, and it was funny because he called me and his, his daughter uh, was in a car accident, and he was concerned that she had a cervical disc from the whiplash. And he knew he could, she couldn't, you know, you can't do a send and receive uh, around the, the cervical area because of the wire that will heat up. It's an antenna and it will, it will get warm. And asked me, I said, well, gosh, you, you know, you could do CT myelography. It was funny because he was a radiologist, but in the modern era, they don't, I mean, they almost don't do that anymore in the States. So he'd kind of forgotten that that was even an option uh, to do and see about the disc uh, as well. So you have to just, you know, think about other options, uh, you know, and what do you have to, to, to do uh, around those. Uh, but the whole body scanners, you know, you can't do. So you have to stick with the kind of the head and receive. If someone has a knee problem, you can do a local coil on the knee and not do kind of like a body scanner, so you can still do that safely. So you just, you know, have to kind of think about uh, what the patient's having done and, and figure that out. Yeah. MRI usually ends up being a big issue for a lot of patients that I think generates a lot of, uh, I guess, maybe controversy more than it should, uh, as far as you know what they could have done, what they can't have done. Has that been, has that been a huge issue for many of your patients, or? Sometimes, yeah. yeah, it seems to be. There's, it's our radiologists because there's so many, um, you know, implantable devices nowadays. Their book is like this thick. They went through literally to say, you know, what sequences can we do? What machine? What device? What year was it made? I mean, they have to go through and, you know, look before the, you know, clear folks. It's getting thicker and thicker. So, go ahead. Yeah, so the wire, yeah, they break the fracture of wire. So I have to admit, I've, I've been lucky, I think, because the neurosurgeons I've always worked with, uh, if we have a fractured lead wire, has always tried to get the complete wire off the nerve. We try not to leave any tail there, and we try and get it off. I can only think of one or two patients out of literally, you know, over the last, you know, 17 years where they could do that, where they had to leave it short. 
Um, so they'll use the operating microscope to get it on, just to make sure they're safe with the nerve and stuff if they need to. It does take longer. It takes them about an hour to do that. And as, as, you know, whereas if you just cut the tail and take it out, you can be done in probably 10 minutes, right? I mean, it's very quick. So it does take longer, but we, we try and get them to do that. They've been pretty good about, you know, doing that just because just to avoid any issues. It, even if you leave a teeny bit, you're probably okay because the issue with the wire is it basically acts like an antenna. So the more you leave, the, the more antenna you have. And if you just have a you know teeny little you know piece, you're you're probably okay. It's probably not going to heat up enough to be a problem. The, the problem is the radiologists you know panic. But as far as what would really happen, it probably wouldn't be a problem. But they worry because they say you didn't take it all out, and your book is telling them you know it's still there. But it probably wouldn't be a problem. No. All right. Um, this is a little bit old data, but the other question and, uh, comes up is, you know, when patients, um, you know, get to end of service for their battery, um, and I have to admit, we, we never say your battery is dead, because just in general, using the term dead in a patient, you know, you don't want people to be able to hear it through the wall. <laughs> it's not good in clinic. <laughs> so we always just say it's end of service. Um, as well, this is a little bit old, the data, because this is the old model number, uh, I think, and it's actually improved. It's running probably about... 80 to 90 percent uh, worldwide now, uh, and this gets back to I think the question that you were asking earlier. If you know if we have, if you have a device that has about say on an average a 50 percent responder rate, so five out of ten patients their seizures are cut in half and more. Well, if that was a medicine and it was time to refill it, only about five of the ten patients would want it refilled because the ones that aren't that much better would say, you know, I want another medicine doctor. I want do something different. And then even some of them would drop off over time because they would have side effects. They'd say, well, it's working, but you know, I want to do something else. So you would really expect if the device, you know, if how well it works is only about, you know, five out of ten patients have a 50% responder rate, then only about five out of ten should say, I want to be re-implanted. But worldwide now it's running about, you know, between eight and nine out of ten. <laughs> So there's a difference there. So why is it from five to eight out of nine? What, who are those other, you know, those other three to four patients that are saying, I want to re-put in, why are they saying it? Well, they're saying it because it's all due to the quality of life and other variables. So they feel better, their moods may be better, uh, their seizures are maybe shorter, uh, their clusters are better, but if you just count seizure numbers, it may not be that big of a change. It's all the other kind of uh, harder to count intangibles uh, that, that push the reimplant rate. Uh, inter interestingly enough, again, if you look at other forms of neurostimulation, if you look at the deep brain stimulation trial, the patients that went to the open label where they had to have their battery replaced, their seizure numbers are almost the same, but their reimplant rate is the same too for the getting the battery change. It runs about 80 to 90 percent. If you look at the neurobase, which was cortically based stimulation, Again, their seizure efficacy data is no better, but the patients that wanted an open label and needed a new battery, and for that to do a new battery, you have to you know, open the, uh, the skin, your, you know, get to your craniotomy site and do the battery because it's implanted in the, the skull, it's still 80 to 90%. So there's something about neurostimulation that's very different from medicines that there's a significant number of patients, probably about a third, that want to be re-implanted that are not driven just by the efficacy. It's these other things that we're all talking about this morning. So it's a very, very different concept, I think, when you, when you look at re-implantation here for the, the battery that way. Um, the side effects, I, it, it, I think this is the easiest part of this. And I always tell patients, because, you know, what do we do when we prescribe a medicine? You know, we say, you know, we're using this. We think it will help your seizures. We usually tell patients, you know, these are common side effects to look for. You know, maybe you can manage one this way if this happens. Um, but we always tell them, you know, here's the prescription, go home. You know, if you have some horrible side effect, you know, call my office. Try not to call though. <laughs> you know, uh, but here's the medicine. But we don't know how they're going to do, right? Because they go home and then, you know, they take it. Whereas the device I adjust in the office right in front of me, or my nurse does, and I know immediately if they have a side effect. And I can make an adjustment and get rid of it. So when they leave my office, they're never having side effects. So it's a very different concept to patients. And, and actually, we tell our patients that. We say, yes, you could have you know, side effects related to it, but I can adjust the settings in my office and get rid of every one of those. So it's, when you go home, you won't continue to have side effects. So it's very different from a medicine, from, from thinking about it as well. Uh, and the side effects that are kind of you know, published were the ones in the controlled trial where they couldn't make those adjustments. So our side effect rate runs 
much lower than the controlled trial be just because of that, because we can adjust it. You know, and you do do that in your office, so it's, it's much better. Uh, so the incidence of kind of hoarseness, cough, you know, paresthesias, I mean, we almost never see these anymore because we make adjustments in the device settings. So and we'll talk about that a little later when we come back to settings. So, you know, yes, these were seen in the pivotal trials because they had to continue, you know, kind of on the same setting. They couldn't make adjustments. But do we see these nowadays? No. So I think these are just helpful because we at least counsel the patients on, you know, if you get a side effect, what it might be. And then we tell them, if you get this, let us know because we can make an adjustment. You know, if you say you're fine in the office, then you go home and you feel a little hoarse or, you know, it tickles your throat, you cough once in a while, you know, let me know next time I see you because I can make adjustments and get rid of these uh, as, as well. Uh, the numbers are actually now probably closer to 70,000 uh, patients worldwide that are unique patients, 100,000 devices. So it's interesting, if you look at neurostimulation kind of globally, if you will, so there's about 70,000 VNSs have been implanted. Uh, deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease, movement disorders, about 70,000 also as well. And if you look over the period of time, uh, you know, they've both been around for quite a while now, there's, there's well over a million patient years of neurostimulation. So it's really pretty impressive when you think about it, you know, that way. I mean, there's a lot, that's a lot, uh, you know, as, as well. Uh, obviously, they're not medicine, so it's nice because our patients don't get medicine side effects. And a lot of our patients, when we tell them that, you know, as I said them this morning, I mean, the discussion we have with patients is always, you know, you could have, you know, VMS, or these are the two or three or four or five medicines, however many there is you haven't been tried on, you know, that are options. You have options. Um, you know, the advantage of the device is you won't have medicine side effects. <coughs> If you're on two medicines, I can add this, and you'll be on the third treatment, but you'll, you won't feel like you're on three medicines. You'll just feel like you're on two. Uh, and then I might even back off a medicine down the road, and you'll be on one, which many of our patients you know, like, because most of them experience medicine side effects. Uh, and many of our patients like the fact that they don't have to worry about, you know, it's not a medicine, so they're not going to have to worry about me monitoring any blood tests or you know, feeling tired or dizzy or off balance or any of the other medicine side effects, because most of these patients by this time have been on three or four or five medicines, so they, they know medicine side effects. So you can push them up because they have refractory seizures, you know, usually two side effects or close to it uh, as, as well. So they, they don't like to worry about that. Uh, and while the device is not approved in pregnancy, uh, it's probably the safest thing to use if you knew someone was going to get pregnant, right? Because there's no teratogenicity with the device. Uh, in the animal studies, that holds up. So uh, we don't usually rec you know, tell people, okay, you got the device, go get pregnant. <laughs> Uh, but from a practical standpoint, it's probably one of the safer things to use. Um, obviously, we've talked about kind of the, the healthcare, the fewer ER visits uh, you can manage it in the office. Uh, this is the other big one too. The, the patients that are just uh, you know struggle with taking their medicine regularly. So whether it's just the household is chaotic, or you know they, the parents just don't you know they just miss medicines for whatever reason. I mean, this is nice because even if they're on a medicine, at least they have one other therapy where you know they're getting it, you know, all the time. You don't have to worry about that. And that does come up in some of our decision making occasionally. You say, okay, mm -hmm. at least this one we know you're getting. It. You can't get around it. Oops. All right, let me stop there before he goes in. Let me see. Did I catch us up a little bit? Maybe. <laughs> um, you know, the one that came up earlier, I was going to answer. So the selection of, you know, kind of the I don't have had them right now for twelve, but the, the non candidates. Uh, so, so negative studies tend not to be published, right? So, you know, just for anything. I mean, if you look at, you know, you know, I tried patients on this medicine, it didn't work for them. I mean, that, that tends not to be published. They, it's, it's rare to get negative studies published. So for VMS, there's, there's been a couple of quote-unquote negative studies that have been published that I think are credible, um, uh, where the response was, you know, not very much. I mean, minimal to, to none. Nobody got worse, but they just weren't good. Uh, the one was on infantile spasms, so I have to admit that's an area that we don't use it. It's interesting because we, we don't tend to use it in young kids with infantile spasms, but we know a lot of those kids will progress to lax gusto, and then once they do it in hydropodex, it doesn't work. <laughs> so we tend not to use it there. Uh, there was one negative study published with kids that had mitochondrial disease, where they used it and said that it was not robust, but I'd be curious if people here have used it, because I was actually telling another group that, and there were several people there that said that, that they had used it, and they thought it did help. And I said, no, then you need to publish your stuff, because the only thing that's out there is, is, is negative. So I don't know if anybody here has used it in that group of, of kids with mitochondrial disease with, with bad epilepsy, but the one thing that's out there is negative. Otherwise, because of the 
you know, the device's mechanism of action that we kind of alluded to, it has all these mechanisms we know about, I think it's much